there's a guy walking around the GTR giving me weird looks. He's gonna, oh, how do you, no, no, get it, get out of here, you, no, I don't care if it's your car, I don't care, I'm not getting out, I'm not, I'm not, I gotta get out of here. Hey folks, today's video is sponsored by Private Auto. Now, the auction sites, they get a lot of hype, a lot of public sales, but you know what? People still want to buy and sell cars privately, and Private Auto is revolutionizing how that is getting done by taking all the worst aspects of selling your car privately, updating them, modernizing them, and improving them. For instance, you get rid of random scammers by having verified buyers who have to confirm their identity with their driver's license and contact information before contacting you. You can make a QR code window brochure that you can leave in the window of your car that people could scan, get information about the car, and contact you, but without you literally putting your name and phone number on the side of the car. You can upload vehicle history reports so people can get the information they need to buy the car, but without, again, sharing your personal information. Then when it comes time to make the deal, you can use Private Auto to accept offers, make counter offers, decline offers, move on, sort through your best offers. You can use Private Auto to make and generate a bill of sale within the program. When it comes time to make the payments, it acts as an escrow service where you can make a payment, a partial payment or a full payment through private auto and it records the identity of the buyer and the seller along with the bill of sale, tracking all that stuff together. That way you don't have to hand over cash, you don't have to worry about fraudulent checks. It's safer, it's easier, it's more streamlined and modernized, and you don't have to give out any of your personal contact information to this person buying the car. It can all go through that private auto portal. It's all very cool and very interesting, revolutionizing a way to sell cars privately. So we've got a special discount code for you guys right now. It's very easy. Hit the link in the video description. Use code the smoking tire. Couldn't be any easier. Code the smoking tire at that link in the video description. And thanks to Private Auto for sponsoring today's video. been in this car for two minutes and already I feel at home and impressed. The seat is one of the most comfortable supportive things I've ever sat in. It is so perfectly formed. I want to I want to bring this seat with me on flights to my desk and and put it in other cars. Wow. Uh, the steering wheel is perfect. The diameter of this wheel is perfect. There's nothing on here except a horn. The idle is so smooth, I thought the car didn't start when it first cranked over, but it cranked over like a light switch. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so what is this? This is a R34 GTR V-Spec 2 that also has a couple of modifications done to it that are period correct and were offered by the factory at the time. So we're gonna get all into all of that now. The basic information, the R34 GTR, let's call that the base one came with the RB26 2.6 liter engine, twin turbocharged, uh, 280 horsepower officially, about 296 pound-feet of torque. In independent testing, a lot of magazines estimated that at the crank these were making more like 330 horsepower. Um, All-wheel drive. This has Nissan's Atessa ETS Pro system. So when the R32 came out in 89, it had a new all-wheel drive system called Atessa. And what that did it, is it divided the torque front and rear, but it didn't do anything left or right. When they developed the Atessa Pro, which later became standard on the R34 GTR, it basically had an active rear differential, able to send torque to the left or the right side in the back. The front is still just a fixed system. This also has rear steer, six-speed manual transmission, of course. Um, car came with vented brakes, but this has upgraded Brembo's 
that are kind of a hand-me-down from the R35, which is an upgrade that's offered by Nissan from the factory. There's a lot of tweaks you can get done to this car that are factory approved and performed by the factory. And they range in price from uh, a different hood to a $200,000 uh, upgrade that makes it uh, like a CSR spec. And the owner of this car was curious about that. And then when he was told the price, he said, you know what? I'll just get some brakes. Other modifications this has. So the V-Spec and the V-Spec 2 basically got some different aero, uh, got a, a hood from racing with the NACA ducts and the heat extractors, some side sills, a front splitter, the rear wing, and um, uh, lower firmer suspension. This has been modified beyond that. It has Olin suspension, which were uh, offered from the factory. So it has the Olin setup that Nissan approves of. It also has this Z-Tune hood, which has the heat extractors down the center, as well as the ones on the fender. And it, again, has a different front fascia and side sills and a little over fender on the rear fender that are different from the regular R34 V-Spec 2. But the engine stock, the drivetrain stock, and uh, you know, as you can see, the center console is stock. Uh, all the words are in Japanese. And I don't know what any of them... Oh, well, that says CD changer in English. Let's, let's give you a little context, okay? The first Skyline GTR, first time that name was used, was in 1969. GTR was basically their term for a car meant for touring car road racing. Uh, it was a little sedan, and it was uh, the development for what would later become the Hakusuka Coupe. But f in 1969, when the car came out, three months after it was debuted, it won its first race. And then it won 52 other races in three years from 69 to 72 52 races in japanese touring car championship and other series bananas there was a little gap from the 70s to 89 of the gtr name but when it came back it came back with a bang and it destroyed on the racetrack absolutely destroyed the specs are insane uh in 29 races it had 29 wins zero losses that was in four seasons of Japanese Touring Car Championship. It also won the Australian Touring Car Championship in 91 and 92. In 1991, it won the Bathurst 1000. And then in 92, because it had done so well, they penalized it and they said, you need to put 300 extra pounds of weight in that car. So they did it and the car crashed and it still won the race. At the 91 Spa 24 hours, it took pole position, set the fastest lap of the race, and won, beating BMW and Porsche. Enough backstory. I wanted to give you the history of this car because it's so special, and we, we hear about this icon all the time, and some of you might wonder why. Why is this car so respected, so expensive, so celebrated, uh, so intimidating to other cars, and such a legend? Well, that's part of why, but now we're going to get to driving it and learn the rest of the story. Torque, 4,400 RPM. Peak power, 6,600 RPM. Redline in this thing is nine. I'm not going near that. I respect this car too much. Jason said he shifts at seven and that is fine for me. Ooh. The grip. Okay. The grip is immense. Uh, I completely understand where the R35 got its jeans from and why it was so sticky feeling. We're up here at about 5,000 feet, so power's down a little bit. Um, you know, 330 horsepower, we've lost probably 10% up here. But man, it did not matter. This, oh, this is a car to play chess with, with the corners. Ooh, sit with a corner, sit with a string of corners. Plan your moves ahead of time. Got a lot of communication through the steering. I'm feeling the vibration of the road. Uh, I'm kind of feeling the weight of the car. Pedal is perfectly spaced for heel-toe downshifting. I can use the side of my foot, don't have to use the actual heel. Perfect placement. Turn-in is happy to do it. It is happy to turn in. And it's sticky. Oh, it's sticky. God, the G's. I'm not using the G-meter, but you could put up some big numbers with this thing. And it just feels... It feels so at home doing this. I mean, it was like, 
In 89, this thing's predecessor destroyed everything on the racetrack. And they, I mean, yeah, like they changed the all drive system a little bit for the 34 and the computing power, but just imagining like the ancestor of this thing being anywhere near as impressive as this in 1990, that's alarming. If they had sold this in America, every American car company would probably be far advanced, more advanced than it is now because they would have been forced to. I mean, this is this would have been evolution. You know, a species will evolve when put under a certain amount of duress and forced to change. I, I cannot believe how little vibration there is in this car. I mean, I've driven plenty of cars that have inline six engines. My BMW, new BMWs. I mean, it's, it is, it feels as if the engine is suspended on magnetic motor mounts. It's not even connected to the chassis. I, I really mean that. I mean, just, I was sitting there in the parking lot revving it just a little bit. There was no tilt to the car. There was no torquing. And, and I just felt zero vibration through the car. Throttle response is surprising because peak power in this car kicks in around 6,600 RPM. Peak torque is at 4,400 RPM. That is quite high compared to a modern turbocharged engine. You know, they're getting things down in like the 1500s, the 1600s these days. But even with that, you know, being slightly below peak torque, oh, it just, it feels responsive. And there's so much like communication between your foot and the throttle and the spring is just perfect. It's just perfect. The steering is slightly light on center and then right there, you get weight to it. I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna push this car hard enough to feel understeer. This car, when the owner bought it, uh, Jason, shout out to Jason for letting me drive this thing. When he bought this car, it was like $100,000 had a lot of miles on it. it had 130 152,000 kilometers on it when he bought it. Uh, and the car was 100 grand. And now we know that these cars are worth significantly more than that. He bought this many many years ago because he's a very very smart person. Do not money shift the very expensive, very beloved, very wonderful R34 GTR. That's a lot of identical vans. You guys going to Area 51? I think you're lost. It's a different direction. The suspension is really good. I mean, I expect it to be good, but when he said he had put an aftermarket, or sorry, an additional upgrade to it from Olin's, I thought, well, why did you do that? His response was that the stock V-Spec suspension was a little tall for him. He thought it just rode a little bit too high. Uh, he called it monster truck. I, I disagree based on seeing the photos, but the stance on this one, I will admit, Jason, is absolutely perfect. We got no rubbing, soaks up bumps really nicely. The car does feel kind of heavy, and I mean, it's got an all-wheel drive system, rear steer, but it's it's not that it feels heavy in that it is resistant to changing direction. It's more like it feels grounded. It feels, it almost feels like an electric car in that all the weight feels like it's very, very down low and spread very, very wide. While we wait for a little bit of a gap, let's talk about the technology this car has. With the R34, it got this LCD screen, which has so many impressive sensors and readouts on it, most of which I would not use. But, I mean, I've got boost, throttle, injector, oil temp, water temperature, exhaust temperature, intake temperature. There's a G meter, there's a lap timer. But one of my favorite ones, which I think is genuinely interesting, is the torque distribution to the front tires. Because this is, this all-wheel drive system is a little bit different in that when Nissan was developing it back in the, in the 80s, they drove and tested and kind of tore apart a Porsche 959 because of course the Porsche 959 had just set the bar uh, for all wheel drive performance vehicles. And they felt like the 959 had a little bit too much understeer. So this car actually operates as a rear wheel drive vehicle until it determines you need the all wheel drive system. So for example, on corner exit, if you have the car set up correctly and all the grip is at the back, and it doesn't detect any understeer problems, it's gonna keep all the power going to the rear. It will only send it to the front when necessary. I think that's awesome, and it keeps the dynamics of the car 
predictable and obviously gets rid of any unwanted understeer you might encounter with a different all-wheel drive system. Another thing is the computational speed of the sensors in this car. With the R33, the car calculated things from all the wheel speed sensors at 100 times per second. In the R34, it was a thousand times per second. Imagine putting an R33 up against a 90s Mustang GT or Cobra. Good night, goodbye. I will race you for pinks on this road course and I will own your Mustang within two corners. And yet the audience in the market said, uh, the car feels a little big to us and Nissan said, okay, we hear you, let's change it. Oh my God. This is a car that I wanna drive 5,000 miles. For real. For me, like the, my favorite cars are cars that are fast, comfortable, and capable and special. Like, you know, cars like the, the Vantage, the V12 Vantage S, um, 575 Marinello, 812, like cars that have great grand touring ability, but also are special. It's not, I don't want to get in a Camry and do it. And this thing feels special, looks special. And yet, I am absolutely comfortable enough to do thousands and thousands of miles on this. And in fact, Jason, the owner, has. He bought this car, he's put 30,000 kilometers on it since then. He's driven it from uh, LA to back to Toronto. He's crisscrossed all over the place in Canada. He's loaned it out to other people. Throttle House filmed this exact car, which is why it kind of smells like maple syrup and friendly healthcare in here. The only indication that tells me it's, a, it's an all-wheel drive car versus feeling like a rear-wheel drive car is that weight. There is a bit of weight in the front. But, oh, if I lean on the gas right there as we come out of the corner, it leans over on the back wheel on the outside tire. Like, the suspension's not too stiff. I can feel it leaning and putting that power down, gripping up. Brakes work very well. The, the pedal has longer travel than I'm used to because so many new cars have very short pedal travel. We just drove the McLaren Senna, which feels like a manual brake system in the first inch. This is like the best parts of an E46 M3 and an Evo and a Supra, all rolled into one amazing dish. But there's the smoothness and the ergonomics in this car like that's what that's what feels E46 to me. The visibility and the ergonomics are so good. There is not a wiggle, rattle, or squeak in this entire vehicle. It has 150,000 kilometers on it, and if you told me it had 10 miles on it, I'd believe you. Oh God, I need to make more money. <laughs> R34 GTR. V spec 2. Honestly, the, the turbos come on so subtly and so smoothly that it doesn't feel like lag. I mean, you, you can feel a little bit of thrust kick in, but somehow down low, there is still a significant amount of torque and power. Below that 4400 number, there is still enough get up and go that I am not going. Okay, when are these turbos showing up? There it is. <laughs> no wonder this destroyed everything on racetracks. God, if you were a driver that got out of any other vehicle and they went, oh, you're gonna be driving the GTR now, you know, welcome to the team. I bet you got in and you went, what is this space technology? Are you allowed to have this? What alien gave this to you? Did you find it in the pyramids? I bet you found it in the pyramids. What tomb was opened and, you know, held the Atessa ETS Pro <laughs> all-wheel drive system? That ancient aliens guy is going, well, well, the R34 was really developed by... A big reason that this car and the R32 and 33 are so amazing is because of one man. So many great, great cars really come down to one person. 
not to say that the team didn't develop a car, but there was one person that went, we're going to do this right. And they led that team and, and they were correct and they had the right people, they hired the right people and they were able to go to bat with the bean counters and the OEM to get that it's approved. And in this case, the man's name was Naganori Ito. He started working for Prince, which became Nissan, in 1959, okay? He was there for the whole Skyline GTR program and then in the 80s, when it was time to make the R32, his superior, his boss, got really sick and had to take time off and he went, hey man, Naganori, you're in charge now. And the, the Skyline that came out before the R32 was not that well received. And he didn't like that. Naganori was not okay with that. He went, you know what? The next one, is gonna make, we're going to make people remember why this is such a legendary name. The result was the R32, which won, like every race, up, down, and sideways. And of course, Naganori stayed with the program. He led the R33, the R34, and then he later uh, became the tech consultant for Nismo. So it was that guy who said, we're gonna make the next one as great as the name is, as great as the first one was, as important as the first one was. And that set up the next 15 years of unbelievable domination on racetracks and in our minds and in our movies and our video games. And remember, always fight your tickets. Use code TST10 on the Off the Record app available in the Android and iOS store or go to offtherecord.com slash TST.